So we must do two things, two great things together to encompass that enormous new view that lies before us, but to encompass it within the framework of science, to see it within the whole categorical framework of science, and to see that these two are not separate, but that they are wedded. The bigness of the idea, the newness of the idea, the greatness of it is one with the structure of science, the structure of being itself. So we've been taking that story of the uh, God-crowned woman as bringing out the sense of love in Christian science on the ascending way. And we've seen that that uh, whole picture is in the Christianity order. It begins with principle, and we saw at the point of principle that that God-crowned woman was clothed with the sun, that she had the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars. It's the spiritual idea as principle's own idea in operation. Then when we came to mind, we saw that she was with child, being with child, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered, and that that birth was full of promise, that the spiritual idea is always the idea of the parent mind, and therefore it is great. As soul, that the great red dragon appears with seven heads to counterfeit the sevenfold principle and ten horns of power and seven crowns upon his head. And that dragon was waiting to devour the child. But we saw that from the standpoint of love, the spiritual idea is always safe, even in the face of animal magnetism. Then at the point of spirit, the woman brings forth that child to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and the child was caught up unto God and to his throne. It was given back to principle. So the spiritual idea is the pure reflection of its divine principle. At the point of life, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God and was fed there for the three and a half, for 1260 days, showing that the spiritual idea is irresistibly and irrevocably leading to divine heights, the way of life, and that life provides and maintains and sustains its own idea. As truth, we see that there was war in heaven, that Michael and his angels fought, and the dragon was cast out into the earth, and the epitome there is that the spiritual idea is always victorious in the warfare with error. That there is a guaranteed victory for the spiritual idea. And now we come to the final tone of love in that Christianity order, where we are going to see that either through science or suffering, the spiritual idea is brought to the full glory of fulfillment. And so uh, we see that this tone of love will show us both methods, the method of science and the method of suffering, a kind of a thumbnail sketch of that fact that we have both methods, that we have the Michael method the way of suffering, 
and we have the Gabriel method, the way of science. So as that text uh, begins and we take it from a Revelation 12 and as Mrs. Eddy has it on page 568 of the textbook, we're going to see that, uh, that both aspects are presented. She has already said that uh, the narrative follows the order used in Genesis when she's referring now to this part and this, uh, the following chapters in Revelation, she says the narrative follows the order used in Genesis. In Genesis, first the true record of creation, the true method of creation is set forth, and then the false. Here also the revelator first exhibits the true warfare and then the false. So it is another instance of that equipollence of God, as though to say it's all God, whichever way you choose. If you choose the way of truth, it's God, it's still God. If you choose the way of love, it is God. Whether it's Michael or Gabriel, it's a God method. So uh, we come to the actual text and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Can you hear where the break is and where the uh, Gabriel method ends and the Michael method comes in? Let's go over it again. The epitome, we said, is uh, uh, concerning the glory of the fulfillment now of this spiritual idea. How does that come about? She gives the two methods. First, she gives the Gabriel method, the method of science. And she gives it in a fourfold way. First, as the word, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. And in the uh, marginal heading there, she has a peon of praise, or a peon of jubilee. It's a fourfold rejoicing that we get here, that if you are going along with the Gabriel state of consciousness, you have a great sense of rejoicing. You have every reason to rejoice. You have a fourfold reason to rejoice. And so from the word standpoint, it is that loud voice in heaven saying, now is come salvation and the kingdom of our God. And it's at that point that she talks about single sins versus all sin. She says, uh, for victory over a single sin, we give thanks and magnify the Lord of hosts. What shall we say of the mighty conquest over all sin? So she's really comparing here uh, a sense of divine deduction versus induction. She says for a victory over a single sin, you know how it is? We, we have a victory over something in our experience and we say, 
oh, I'm so, I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for that. And then something comes along and then we, we gain our victory over that and we're so grateful for that. And so we kind of gather and add up as we go along these single victories, building up and building up and building up one victory after another. This is the inductive method. It's really a touch of truth. It's a touch of truth to build up and build up. But she says, what shall we say of the mighty conquest over all sin? This gives the higher standpoint of love because that victory over all sin is the coming out from the principle, you see, coming out from the general. So to say, take the general, take the genus, take the principle, stick to that womanhood sense because only that womanhood sense can experience the victory over all sin. And Mrs. Eddy takes that way, that Gabriel way of going out from love. Then we have a touch of the Christ. Now is come the power of his Christ. Could you hear that, by the way? Could you hear that difference between the single sin and the all sin? That one is like having a lot of specifics and you add up a lot of specifics and you induce, you're hoping to induce back to the principle. It's an inductive method, it's a scientific method, but it's an inductive method. The other is a deductive method, it comes out from the principle. As soon as you come out from the principle, you have victory over all sin. You have the solution to all sin. And you don't have to build up and build up. You come right out from the whole. Then the touch of the Christ. Now is come the power of his Christ, for the accuser is cast down. The accuser is not there. And she says, love sends forth her primal and everlasting strain. She's putting the accent more and more on love, uh, pushing on really and on beyond the point where revelation is, pushing on into the field of her own mission and her own discovery at the point of love. It's going beyond truth to love. Then Christianity, and they overcame him, meaning the accuser, by the blood of the lamb, it's they, you see, they, a Christianity tone, by the blood of the Lamb on the basis of the Christ. Christianity is always on the basis of the Christ. And they loved not their lives unto the death, which means that they laid their lives down. They put their own mortal sense of life down. And it's at this very point that she brings in that theme of self-abnegation which is the putting down of the mortal self. He says, self-abnegation by which we lay down all for truth or Christ in our warfare against error is a rule in Christian science. In other words, you have to go that way. Sooner or later, if you're going to progress in Christian science, that's the rule, that you've got to have that self-abnegation. The mortal self has to be laid down. This rule clearly interprets God as what? Huh? Divine principle, as life, as truth, as love. It clearly interprets divine science something we wouldn't really expect, that if we lay down the mortal sense of life that 
that the reward would be so big that we would get the interpretation of divine science. We get our new self. It's a, a new self. It is the self that is patterned after the, the selfhood of the principle, the selfhood of divine principle itself. It is God principle's own self as life represented by the Father, as truth represented by the Son, as love represented by the Mother. That's our true I, our true ego, then, is that we are uh, patterned after life, truth, and love as that divine principle, love. This is a very uh, high rendering, uh, the only time really in the textbook that she would, uh, would, would state it in this way and would lift everything to the highest level of the synonymous terms themselves. And then uh, a science tone, rejoice ye heavens, there's certainly every reason to rejoice after the word, the Christ and Christianity, as we have, have seen it for that, uh, that uh, genus, that principle to overcome all sin. The fact that uh, the accuser is not there, that love sends forth her primal and everlasting strain, that we have our new selfhood as the selfhood of divine science itself. And finally, the science tone then, rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Ye that dwell in them. The ascended ones, the ones that have ascended to that state of consciousness, rejoice. And there, uh, the marginal heading is the robe of science and she speaks about being faithful over the few things, being faithful over those few things. What do we know as those few things, huh? those 15 root notions, those uh, four and four and seven, to be faithful over those few things, we are made ruler over many by being faithful over the, those categories or those points of intersection of the, say, of the ascending way. In a way, she uh, gives an indication too. If you are faithful over that, those few things of the ascending way, that then you are made ruler over the many things of the, of the descending way. When uh, are we ruler over many things? When we are conscious of the supremacy of truth by which the nothingness of error is seen. So she gives a, a summary uh, again through the four that we are conscious of the supremacy of truth by which the nothingness of error is seen. That's the word. And then she says, he that touches the hem of Christ's robe, Christ, and masters his mortal beliefs, animality and hate, Christianity, rejoices in the proof of healing, science. And what is that proof of healing? In a sweet and certain sense that God is love. That's the proof of a healing. Hmm. That is the proof of healing. A sweet and certain sense that God is love. That's a true healing. So we see that she has uh, shown us now the my, uh, the uh, Gabriel standpoint 
And then we come to the Michael standpoint, the suffering sense. We've just seen the science sense. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. Can you hear it change? You hear the tone change? For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So he has but a short time. Uh, error is on its way out, but you have a, something to contend with, whereas love has nothing to contend with. Love has no contest, but truth has a contest. And it's there that she says, alas for those who break faith with divine science. They are still dwellers in the deep darkness of belief, in the surging sea of error. What must the end be? They must expiate their sin through suffering the Michael method. The devil knoweth that his time is short. It is that error is not long lived, not eternal. The dragon is stung to death by his own malice so that the whole thing has the seed of self-destruction within itself. Error will destroy itself. And how long that will take will depend on the, the condition of error and on the, uh, the condition of our own development in consciousness. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. That is not in uh, the apocalypse but it follows uh, directly after Revelation 12, 13, that to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Science, really, or principle, those two wings of principle, the two aspects of science, of understanding and demonstration, We might even say the ascending way and the descending way, the way of understanding and the way of demonstration, the two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So we have that uh, uh, that sense of the flood being cast forth, um, those waters being the material theories, material thinking, uh, all that has to do with the mental elements. And Mrs. Eddy says, uh, mentions that flood and says, uh, will there be a new flood to drown the Christ idea? And then she gives her answer and shows that her standpoint is now clear that nothing can touch the spiritual idea, that the earth helps the woman, that she knows that the earth 
is helping the woman. So she says that, that millions of unprejudiced minds are waiting and watching for rest and drink. So that there is an openness to the idea that the earth is open, that, that uh, consciousness is open, that there are simple seekers for truth, weary wanderers, a thirst in the desert. What if the dragon should send forth a new flood to drown the Christ idea? The dragon can no more drown your voice with its roar, can no more sink the world into the deep waters of chaos and old night. It can't happen anymore. Why? Because we have reached the point of truth and love. The idea has been stated in its science, and it is safe. It has been stated in its science, not just stated by an individual Christ consciousness, not just stated by Jesus as the Christ, but now it is the Christ science. And so she shows the confidence within herself that the idea will go on and can never be lost. In this age, the earth will help the woman. The spiritual idea will be understood. And we certainly begin to see how that earth helps the woman, that that idea of science just is being shadowed forth everywhere in the world. Then she gives a survey of uh, what John has shown us. And the marginal heading there is pure religion enthroned. It's on page 571. She refers to him as the scribe of spirit, the immortal scribe of spirit and of true idealism and says that he has furnished the mirror. Elsewhere, doesn't she say, call the mirror divine science? Call the mirror divine science. He has furnished the mirror in which mortals see their own image. He depicts the thoughts which he beholds in mortal mind and rebukes the conceit of sin and foreshadows its doom. With his spiritual strength, he has opened wide the gates of glory, illumined the night of paganism with the sublime grandeur of divine science. So he hasn't even come to the city four square yet. <laughs> he takes away mitre and scepter and thrones pure and undefiled religion so that divine science is the pure religion. It is the undefiled religion that binds everything back to principle, that everything is caught up unto God, unto principle. This is the true religion, the pure religion, and lifts on high only those who have washed their robes white in obedience, science, and suffering. See that? There she ends with the two methods. That no matter which method you take, if you take the way of obedience, the way of love, the way of Gabriel, the way of the 7,000 year period, then your robes are washed white. If you take the way of suffering, the way of truth, the way of Michael, the way of the 6,000 year period, your robes are still washed white. So there is no chance that we will not be saved. It is only a question of uh, which method. And naturally that's something that we can't, we can't decide for ourselves, can we? 
just uh, as we said that we can't um, decide to take the standpoint of divine science or decide to take the standpoint of science itself, but we can culture that standpoint within ourselves. We can nurture it. We can expose ourselves to it. We can live with it and uh, go that way of taking the concept of the higher standpoint and building the tonality of that concept, to build within ourselves the tone, the sense, the awareness, the warmth, the livingness of that higher standpoint until it becomes more and more natural to us and becomes our consciousness. <laughs>